Our next speaker this morning is Dr. Scott Harper, Scott Harper uh, WCU Plant Pathology. I asked him to talk about some of the other stone fruit viruses in addition to ecstasies that we have in Washington, because this year was a weird year. It was cool, and we saw quite a few different viruses, and um, we wanted to review what those are that we might be confusing with ecstasies or might have been ignoring. So thank you very much, Scott, for covering this topic. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, like Tian said, I'm talking about the other cherry viruses today. I will not for once be talking about X disease in a little cherry, but if anyone has any questions about it, here I am. So last year we had, well, yeah, it is last year now, isn't it? We had a really cool spring. Now, normally this doesn't matter, but much like Gary mentioned this morning, temperature matters for pathogens particularly viruses, because they don't really care about the wet, they don't care about the sunshine. They like the temperature. Temperature really matters for viruses, and we had a really cool spring last year. And this meant that we saw a couple of viruses that we hadn't seen for a couple of years, because we'd had relatively sprung, warm springs prior to that, popping out, starting to show up in people's orchards. And so we thought it was a good time to remind you that these things are out there, they exist, they matter, uh, because they have long-term effects on the productivity of your orchards. And as we get out of the X disease problem and get this thing under control, some of these other viruses are going to come back and we're going to see more of them because we'll be replanting. So, oops, that's going backwards. So we're likely to have another cool spring this year. At least that's what the forecast says. It's been kind of weird now, so we don't really know. But understanding what they look like, what you're seeing, and how to deal with them is going to be very important moving forward. So we're going to cover, well, five viruses that are around and quite common up here. First, pruned wolf, pruned to ring spot, two isla viruses. Usually, if you've got one, you've probably got them both. Cherry rasp leaf, cherry leaf roll, and tomato ring spot. Especially if anyone here is from Oregon, that one matters to you guys. So pruned wolf and pruned to ring spot, they're probably a couple of the oldest viruses that we have in cherry. They're ubiquitous in the Northwest. About 50% of the older plantings have it, probably higher. They're, these things are everywhere. Now, much you'll, this is going to sound like a broken record by the time I'm done with this talk, but these are all transmitted by propagation or root grafting between neighboring trees. Pretty often, trinistochronic ring spot are also transmitted by pollen, which is kind of a nuisance. It's inefficient. It's not you know, maybe one in every couple of hundred pollinations causes this to spread over time, but there's a lot of pollen out there. There's a lot of infected trees shooting out infected pollen, and there's a lot of it landing on your trees. So over time, it's almost a certainty that it's probably going to wind up in your trees. It doesn't have any insect vectors that we know of. There's been a lot of speculation in the last ooh, 80 years since these things were relatively described and reported, but no one's found anything yet. Come on, there we go. So both of these two viruses cause long-term damage to your trees in terms of decreasing yield, growth, and productivity. The, one of the things that's kind of interesting about them and what where we start to see crossover some of the little cherry or X symptoms is they can cause smaller heart-shaped or really pointed fruit, as you can see here. This is a really good example that uh, one of the uh, field crew found. So this can be mistaken for little cherry, but usually you don't see the color um, change as well. So smaller pointed fruit, probably pruned dwarf or pruned ring spot. Pruned dwarf could also cause fruit deformation, makes them lumpy, makes them smaller, makes them kind of ugly looking, sometimes with um, calluses or cankers on the outside. Uh, depends on the variety, depends on the environment, depends on when they're infected. So cool springs give you this. Pruned wolf, you've got foliar symptoms, leaf symptoms. This is primarily what you'll be seeing when you encounter these things. Fruit tends to take a lot of um, pathogen there. Foliar symptoms, not so much. We see mottling, the yellow spots on the leaves. Uh, sometimes clotic rings, so yellow rings around the leaves, or sometimes distortion around the leaf margins or around the veins and midrib. Similar, pruned wolf or pruned ring spot, much the same. Symptoms appear with cold springs. You'll start to see these things. The symptoms start to appear in April, May, through to about June. You don't see them generally later in the year. This is an early season symptom for the most part. Sometimes prince to ring spots, distortion of leaf margin, the depressions, as you can see in the first picture. You can see spots mottling, uh, sometimes shot holding, uh, different from fungal shot holding. It's kind of irregular, just appearing in the leaves. 
very, very common, very, very much something you're going to encounter if we have a cold spring. Now, controlling these things is really, really hard. They've been trying for 80 years and haven't really gotten on top of this thing because it's not a, a significant enough pathogen to say, let's eradicate an orchard, but it's something that's a long-term annoyance. Symptoms get worse and worse as the seasons go on, as the years go on, and you'll start to see significant impact in your growth and productivity, particularly you get, as trees get 10 years past infection. Certainly if you've got trees that are 20 years old or something and they're really getting up there in age, it starts to really start to impact your plants. The thing with prune off and prune scrot ring spot is they act synergistically with each other. So if you've got both, the symptoms are generally worse. And they can act synergistically. In other words, they work together with uh, cherry leaf or virus, which is what I'm going to talk about next. It exacerbates the, the symptoms of that and uh, makes it worse. As with any of these viruses, really the only control you've got is to get rid of the trees. So if you do see something severely affected, please get rid of it. It's only going to spread and spread and spread from that point onwards. Cherry leaf roll. Now, this is one of those viruses that you either have it or you don't. If you're in Yakima, some of the Yakima counties, there are pockets of it. If you're in Franklin County, for reasons that kind of escape us, there's a lot of it there. Don't know why, but there is. So not so much up here around Wenatchee, but there are pockets. Some, some orchards have it, some orchards don't. Again, transmitted by proper irrigation or root grafting between neighboring trees. This is how it spreads mostly through an orchard. It is seed transmissible very, very inefficiently, and also by pollen, again, very, very inefficiently. Prune dwarf kind of can spread that way. Cherry dwarf reflow is very hard to spread that way, but it does happen. They've suspected nematode transmission for over 50 years. No one's found a nematode who can transmit this thing yet. They're still working on it, and no one really knows, but it's there, and it keeps showing up in beaver's orchards. The other way that this shows up is and really all of these viruses show up, is through bad propagated material. You graft off an infected tree, you wind up with another infected tree. And so this is how these things spread and why they keep showing up. Now, the characteristic symptom of cherry leaf roll is, as the name would suggest, well, just sound very inventive with names, is leaf rolling. So you see the margins, the leaves will take on a scalloped uh, appearance and kind of obvious when you see it. You also see um, leaf and bud rosetting where they cluster at the end of a limb. So you have the area of blank wood then a like, looks like a little palm tree on top of a limb. So this is characteristic of this uh, virus. can also be mistaken for the phytoplasma. In bad cases, you will see this with X disease. I think someone just turned the volume up. All right. Foliar symptoms, like I said before, are more severe when prune dwarf or prune stochrotic ring spot is there. It shows up faster. It shows up more severely. Unfortunately, these viruses often co-infect co trees, so you'll usually get this happening. And it's something that you need to be aware of. The rosetting gets particularly bad when you get uh, the viruses infecting together. The other thing that has been seen with uh, cherry leaf roll is it causes long-term dieback of affected trees. So this is a slow virus. This is a very slow pathogen. You had to be kind of patient to work on it. This is not X disease that makes takes three or four seasons to really hit you. This takes 10 to 20 years to really hit you. So this is a problem with old line orchards that have been in the ground a long time. If you're hanging on to an old orchard, you'll start to see these symptoms where you start seeing dieback on bare limbing. So you can, as you can see on the picture there, just bare, one side of the tree is bare. No fruit, nothing growing on it. It's just dead. And gradually that will become the entire tree, as you can see from the second picture there. I've had a couple of pockets of this in Oregon lately, and it's, it's around. So if your tree starts doing this and dying, it's not coming back. It's not going to grow back next season. Once that side dies, it's dead for good. So get rid of it. Like I said, removing infected trees, very, very important. Given the propensity of this thing to spread via root grafting, the same sort of treatment we recommend for X disease of cutting the tree, uh, treating with Roundup to see if any neighboring trees are attached to it is a very good thing to try because if the trees are attached, it's probably they've both got the virus, so you can get rid of as many as you can that way. Because of the spread of this through seed and through propagative sources, we recommend that the use of clonal or sealing rootstocks. Rootstocks have been one of the things that I identified as being important in the spread of this particular pathogen. And if you, because it can persist in broken root pieces, much like many of these pathogens can, fumigation between plantings to get rid of any broken bits of plant is a good idea. 
All right, Cherry Raspberry, there's something with a very sim similar sounding acronym, CRLV this time. This thing is also present in the Northwest, noticing a trend here. Its distribution is scattered. This is something you either have it in your orchard or you don't. There is no geographic pattern that we've seen to where this thing shows up. It's just you either have it or you don't, probably through, again, bad planting material. Transmitted by propagation and root grafting. Yet again, these all are. But this one is different. This one's transmitted by the dagger nematode, Xiphonema americana. This thing's around, also but to some extent by Xiphonema reversi, but the dagger nematode is its primary vector. So if you have the dagger nematode in your orchard and you have this, you've got a problem. Nematodes don't move that quickly, but they will spread things throughout an orchard and as they work their way through the uh, orchard itself. And it is relatively efficient at transmitting it. It's not like a leaf hopper. It doesn't move as fast as leaf hopper, but they're very good at it and they will transmit it through your orchard. The symptoms of rasp leaf are, as the name would suggest, a characteristic rasp slash or tattered um, shape on the edge of the leaves. Make the serrations on the margins become much more pronounced and obvious, as you can see here. Uh, it does cause some twisting of the leaves, sometimes upwards, sometimes a scroll like a rolling twisting. And you see characteristic nations, which are basically small lumps, nice dark green lumps on the lower surfaces of the affected leaves, which looks like this. Now, you can sometimes tell the nations from the top, they'll often appear near the leaf margin and leaf veins, or oh, sorry, around the main midrib of the veins. You can sometimes see it from the top, sometimes not, it depends how bad it is, but they're usually quite kind of characteristic dark green, far darker than the leaf itself. The lumps themselves can be as small as like an eighth of an inch, or they can be much larger, sticking out through the leaf. You can see here the characteristic uh, twisting of the leaf as well. This is something that's been showing up for a while, particularly in the last year, because this really likes cold temperatures. When you get temperatures of the springs below 60, below 65, this thing starts showing up. It likes the cold. It doesn't like it when it's hot. If we have a nice hot spring, you don't see this thing. So long-term, it can cause dieback of infected limbs, dieback of the tree. Eventually, the tree will die. It, the symptoms show up first on the lower parts of the tree, This because this is coming from, remember, from the roots up. So it's coming up the trunk, getting into those lower limbs first, and barely working its way up. If trees are infected in the first or second leaf stage, so in particular, if you get bad nursery stock, trees will become stunted quite quickly. So it's kind of easy to screen out young trees that get infected. Adult trees are much harder to spot or they don't become stunted because they're infected later in life, they're already established. And control, unfortunately, relies on tree removal or eventually, if you have enough of this, orchard removal. And if you do have it established in your field, you're going to have to fumigate between plantings to get rid of as many of those nematodes as you can. It's not guaranteed getting rid of nematodes completely is a hard thing to do in an orchard, but killing off as much of the generation that is carrying that vi the, um, virus is very important for helping clear it. The other thing with cherry rasp leaf that you need to be aware of, particularly if you are shifting between cherry and apple production or vice versa, is that this thing causes flat apple. This virus can also infect apples. The nematodes will happily feed on apple. And it causes a the disease known as flat apple, where the apples are basically compressed vertically, hence the name. And if you are going to rip out a cherry orchard and you've got this, you've got to pro and you can plant apples, you absolutely need to fumigate to get rid of this thing. You don't want it to transfer between crops. Last one is tomato ring spot. Tomato ring spot virus. This cherry leaf roll and uh, cherry rasp leaf are all in the same virus family. And so you notice a lot of commonality between the three. This has been found in scattered distributions throughout much of the Northwest, particularly in Northern Oregon. So Hood River, the Dulles, there have been a few sites there that have had a large outbreak of this in the past uh, two to three years. It is found up here in Washington. It's scattered. It's around. It's one of those viruses that's around. Unfortunately, it infects absolutely everything. There, is, there are very few plants it can't get into. It can infect row crops. It can infect every sort of tree fruit you can think of. You've got grapes, it can infect grapes. It can infect everything. It's horrible. Unfortunately, again, transmitted by root, and root, root crafting and propagation of infected material. It's also seed transmissible. shows up in... It's inefficient, but it can be transmitted through seed. And this thing's got a lot of nematode vectors, primarily dagger nematode, but there are other nematodes that can transmit this. They're around, they are present, they are a menace, particularly if you're transmitting or changing between crops. 
In cherries, it's got several diagnostic symptoms that um, it has, but it's sometimes easy to confuse with other viral diseases. The main one's Eola rasp leaf. This is a very old disease that was described ooh, in the 50s, I think, that looks much like uh, cherry rasp leaf, but it's not. Stem pitting, de depressions in the wood. So this is kind of an interesting little symptom. I'll show you that in a minute. Necrosis near the graft union. This can kill a tree. Of all the diseases I'm talking about today, this is probably the worst. I'll save the worst for last, sorry. But this is a pretty nasty thing if you get it established in your field. It can cause small immature fruit, which can be, again, confused with a little cherry. And as a whole, it causes gradual decline and die back of your orchard. So here's the old raspberry. Here's an example of it. Um, someone spotted down in Oregon. You see somewhat the twisting of the leaves, not quite as pronounced as cherry raspberry. The leaf margins are quite as heavily affected uh, as raspberry. And you see some small, I hope you can see it on that screen, some small inations, some small little dark green lumps next to the leaf midrib. So if you've got donations, you've probably got cherry rasp leaf, you might have this. Stem pitting is an interesting disease uh, symptom that often shows up in woody perennial plants caused with some of these viruses. And basically what this is, is the tree is, for lack of a better term, reprogrammed in terms of its growth and development. So in certain spots in the trunk, it decides, I'm not going to produce any more xylem, I'm going to produce lots more phloem. And so you wind up with these lumps and depressions in the trunk itself, which can lead to the trees taking on a sometimes in, in small indentation, sometimes in particularly bad cases, a ropey or twisted appearance that you can even see through the bark. This is a particularly you know, mild example, but the example they took from uh, a couple of trees in Oregon above and below the graft union, you, you can see those small pits and grooves work, in the bark itself. The problem with this is your tree is no longer growing normally. Its vascular system is affected. It's twisted. It's not working properly. So what you wind up with is a tree that is not going to grow as well. It's not going to develop as well because it's got some serious restrictions in its graft union, in its uh, vascular system. The other thing this causes in relation with this is sometimes necrosis of the graft union. So you see a brown line roughly on the graft. That means the phloem is dead. So and if it extends long enough around the tree, it effectively girdles the tree and can kill it. Uh, much like many of these other viruses, decline and dieback can be very uneven. Sometimes it's just one leader dies and the other half the tree dies. It's a slow, slow decline because you think your vascular system's not working, things that your root system isn't happy. Basically, it's gradually strangling the tree, for lack of a better term. Dieback can take several years to appear, but when it does, it's, it's easy to spot. Nice bare limbs, lots of blank wood, sometimes some rosetting on the ends and just Half the tree dies, then the other half dies. But it can take several years after infection to appear. This is not a fast virus. Usually it's far too late by the time this, you start seeing the characteristic symptoms. So these are very slow, deliberate pathogens. Like I said, it infects everything. For lack of a better term, it can infect all kinds of things, which makes control really, really critical of this thing. You have to get rid of as many of the host plants out of that orchard site if you are changing between orchards, if you want to replant, you've got this thing present, that orchard basically has to be taken down to bare ground and kill as many plants in years as you can, because this can get into, much like ecstasy can, it can get into dandelions, it can get into a number of weeds that, lead, that the nematodes will feed on and keep that cycle going. So you've got to break that cycle, break the plant cycle, and then kill as many of the nematodes by fumigation. Recommendation is to help purge that field to allow that nematode population to clear out or at least clear out the virus because these viruses, at least rasp leaf, leaf roll, and um, tomato ring spot, can also replicate inside not only the plant, which as you'd expect, they can replicate inside the nematode itself. So you need, but it doesn't pass between generations. So if you can purge that generation of the leaf hoppers, you can start to clear out the population. Now, they recommend, and this is from uh, one of the USDA folks who works on this, of leaving a field fallow and whacking anything with herbicides that pops up to allow that field time to clear. So that long rambling talk is uh, be aware of these other viruses. Yes, X disease and little cherry are the number one pathogens out here and the industry is going to survive or not on the basis of dealing with X disease. But as we get out of it, as we get into normal replanting cycles, we need to be aware of these other viruses. They are around, they are, sp are spreading. And particularly if you have a cold spring this year, which we're likely to do, you'll start seeing them. You can test for these. 
Most of these are very old viruses, well described, well characterized. Nearly all commercial and university diagnostic labs have the capability of testing for these. But if you are going to test, you want to be tested early in spring, between March and May, depending on the weather, before it starts heating up, before it gets above 70, is the best time, the best temperature range to start testing for these things. And with all of these, if you have them, tree removal is the best option as well as fumigation to break the nematode transmission cycles. Thank you.